We're going to get started. Uh, my name is Kevin Delaney. I am editor-in-chief of Quartz, which is a sister news organization to The Atlantic. We are all digital, and we're focused on global business. We're online at qz.com, and you may have seen our morning email newsletters, which we printed out for you around the campus here. So the, the panel today is talking, we're talking about the challenge of building American jobs. Um, we're going to leave plenty of time for questions from you all, so uh, please uh, save them up, and we will have people come around uh, with microphones after we've uh, launched the discussion for a little while. We have a great panel here representing different parts of the discussion around job creation, one of the most important issues. Uh, it's pretty easy to argue facing our country right now. I'm going to start at the end with very quick introductions. Uh, we have Secretary Elaine Chao. She was the Secretary of Labor of the United States from 2001 to 2009. She's also served as President and CEO of the United Way of America, Director of the Peace Corps, and Deputy Secretary at the U.S. Department of Transportation, among other things. I'm going to move next to her. There, Saru Jayaraman. She is co-founder and co-director of the Restaurant Opportunities Center United, which organizes restaurant workers. And she's the director of the Food Labor Research Center at the University of California, Berkeley. She also has a book, which is called Behind the Kitchen Door, uh, which you can buy in the bookstore outside if you, uh, if you want to, following the discussion. Uh, next to her is Douglas Holtz Eakin. He's president of the American Action Forum, co-director of the Partnership for the Future of Medicare. He serves on the board of the Tax Foundation and is on the Research Advisory Board of the Center for Economic Development. Uh, he served as director of domestic and economic policy uh, for John McCain's presidential campaign in, from 2007 to 2008, and he was the director of the nonpartisan Congressional Budget Office. Sitting next to me, Austin Goolsby. He's professor of economics, University of Chicago School of Business. Um, he was chairman of the US Council of Economic Advisors and was the youngest member of President Obama's cabinet, apparently. Wow. So there we are. You can see we have a great group here. Um, and we're going um, to we're gonna, we're gonna dive right in with uh, two of what I think are the most important questions we want to walk away with answered. First, we're going to talk about what the state of the US, of U.S. job creation is today. And then secondly, we're going to talk about what the most important things are uh, to be done about. It. What are the big ideas to actually solve this problem uh, and make sure they're good jobs for, for us and for our children down the line? So Secretary Chow, I wanted, I'd like to start with you um, to help us set the stage for uh, thinking about what uh, job creation, the dynamics around job creation today. And then I'll ask the others to, to come in as well. Can you start us off? Well, obviously, the current economic situation is not very uh, rosy. Um, the last GDP growth has just been um, downgraded a bit uh, to 1.6% uh, GDP growth, which is more, far more anemic than uh, everyone had hoped. Unemployment rate is 7.6%. The uh, level of discouraged workers who have left the workforce is uh, of great concern. And the actual numbers of people who are unemployed plus uh, uh, who want uh, to have full-time work but can't find it and are marginally attached to the workforce, uh, when, you know, the real unemployment rate is actually near 14 percent. So I think the whole aspect about job creation, uh, having dignity at work, having a purpose at work, is one that concerns our nation um, you know, dramatically. Obviously, employment is very important because uh, it gives a person uh, a sense of purpose. And all the studies that we have shown, uh, that we have done, and uh, studies that have done outside the department have shown that when people go to work, they are much more psychologically healthy. Uh, they are also physically healthier. So job creation is very important. Unfortunately, we've had a, um, an economic crisis in 2008, uh, from which uh, the rebound has not been as quick as uh, many, all of us would have liked. Job creation doesn't really come from the government sector, and you're going to get some pushback on this from, I'm sure, some of the other panelists. And also, we are now in a globalized economy where we don't control the number of jobs. Uh, we, we are not the only instigators of the factors of uh, successful job creation. And so it, one of the key questions, which I think you will be uh, thinking about as this discussion goes forward is what is the role of government in fostering the kind of environment through which the private sector uh, can increase jobs. 
Most of the job creation occurs with small businesses. In fact, 66% uh, of um, the net new jobs being created these days are created by small businesses. So the plight of small businesses, how regulations affect them, how taxes affect them, how overall confidence of the employer uh, becomes very, very important. And so you're going to hear, uh, obviously, a discussion about that. But uh, job creation is, in fact, in many ways, um, you know, pretty basic. It's uh, countries that have shown consistently lower tax rates, less regulations, less burdens on regulations, uh, greater fiscal discipline, and greater transparency, respect for the rule of law, have generally done a much better job uh, in job creation. Sarah, do you want to jump in? Sure. What's, your, what's your view of the state of job creation in the U.S. right now? So I think it's important to think about the sectors of the economy that actually are growing right now. Um, they happen to be the two fastest growing sectors of our economy right now are retail and restaurants. And I know a lot about restaurants. I wrote a book about it. Um, and the restaurant industry right now is over 10 million workers. It's one in 12 American workers. And it happens to be the fastest growing, actually, sector of the economy. It actually was one of the sec only sectors of the economy to not suffer dramatically during the economic crisis of the last couple of years. In fact, the industry has just posted record sales coming out of the economic crisis. Gro there's still job growth, actually. They're posting job growth right now. Um, so they're doing really well. Unfortunately, the restaurant industry holds another uh, accolade. They also happen to be the absolute lowest paying employer in the United States. So seven of the 11 lowest paying jobs in America and the two absolute lowest paying jobs in America with the least benefits are restaurant jobs, people who touch our food. Below farm workers, below day laborers, below anybody you think of as a low wage worker, the restaurant industry is the lowest wage employer. And you'll hear from the industry, oh, this is because we have razor thin profit margins when in fact on average, most restaurant workers actually work for very large Fortune 500 corporations, so growth may be in small business, I would agree with that, but the vast majority of restaurant workers are working at Olive Garden, Applebee's, IHOP, earning the minimum wage of $2.13 an hour. So the minimum wage for tipped workers in the United States has stagnated for the last 22 years at $2.13 an hour because of behind closed door deals that the National Restaurant Association has struck with Congress. And so what we've got essentially is the largest and fastest growing sector of our economy in the context that Elaine is talking about. You know, definitely there's a, there are problems with job growth, but you've got two sectors that are dramatically growing. Unfortunately, those sectors happen to be the absolute lowest paying job uh, employers in the United States. You've got the largest sectors proliferating the lowest paying jobs. For new entrants into the economy, this means that young people, older people being laid off from other sectors are finding these incredibly low, even poverty wage jobs. Um, you know, stories of people who've been financial analysts now working in restaurants. I'm sure you've read about that in the New York Times. Um, you know, I've been talking about that on lots of national news shows. Uh, and that what they're finding is incredibly low-wage jobs. And so I think while we're thinking about job growth, we have to think about job quality. Okay. And what you're describing is that the, the quality of the jobs that, create, that are being created is very low. Doug, I, I, your I view think, of job creation specifically, the, yeah, the, the dynamic range. I think we should not be one bit happy about what's going on right now. I mean, yeah. we, we, we have all of these indicators of the distress. And we... You know, Elaine's covered most of the top line ones. The unemployment rate's high. Comprehensive measures of unemployment that look at inability to get work and have to work part-time are, are in double digits still. Labor force participation is low. Um, the number of jobs we're creating typically in a month is pretty much enough to keep up with um, uh, the GDP growth, but not enough to, to really draw down the backlog of you know, 15, 20 million people who may, in fact, mm -hmm. be out there looking for work. So there's nothing good about that, and it has big consequences. We know that the durations of unemployment are extremely long in this recovery, and all the evidence is that's a permanent scar on many people's careers, that, that we really do lose a tremendous amount as a nation when people remain unemployed uh, for, for long periods of time. Um, I'm particularly worried about the younger workers who were disproportionately hit by this uh, downturn and whose durations are, are quite high. Uh, they've suffered an enormous economic growth, some of whom 
may not recover, and, and I don't think we, we really have a good answer for that. And then there's a group of older workers as well who, who structurally just don't seem to have a good place to go. Hmm. So we, this is not a, a pretty situation. Um, but that, that's what I came here to talk about. I came here to attack the media. Um, <laughs> this is what I'm worried about. Yeah. And you can tell me if I've got it right. We've now seen you know, consumer confidence tick up to five-year highs, um, housing's uh, Housing price rebounding, yeah. And we're getting all these happy talk stories about how things are fine. Yeah. They're not. You guys have to stop it. All right, I'll, uh, I'll note that down and we'll, we'll work on it. You can, you can read uh, Quartz tomorrow and see if it... Uh, Austin, do you want to jump in? The dynamic right now, anything to add to... But yeah, look, the, there's not a big secret o over a... On, in any one month, the job numbers are extremely variable. So yeah. we've been averaging 150,000 a month, yeah. and that's plus or minus 100,000. And so whenever you see people on TV, whether it's me or Doug or anyone, ignore anything they say unless it's happened for three months in a row. Then it means something. But if it's just for that month, it could be anything. The longer run secret is how many jobs we're creating is 100% tied to how fast the economy is growing. And so the fact that GDP growth has been modest 2%, 2.5%, when the productivity per worker is about 2% a year growth, tells you if you want to grow 2% a year, you don't really have to hire anybody to grow 2% a year. Uh, and so we have to get that growth rate higher. And the times when we've seen substantial improvements in the job market have been short-lived over the last three or four years. And they have been correlated with those periods where the growth rate got up, you know, a little above two and a half, pushing 3%. Mm -hmm. That is, that has a pessimistic and an optimistic side to it, I'd say. The pessimistic side is, as crummy as it is here, look around, look at Europe, look at what's happening in Japan and Asia, oh my God, you know, you're, at, at growing at two and a half percent a year put, makes us essentially the fastest growing economy in the advanced world. So it has not been a fun patch for the world economy, and that's why job markets remain in distress. What Doug said is exactly right. The biggest tragedy of the distressed job market are young workers. The unemployment rate of young workers is unbelievably high, and what progress we have seen is actually 100% of the net job creation has been to people over age 50. And people 25 and younger, it's been a devastating period. And hopefully the future will not be like the past. The past has shown that lives with you for the rest of your career or at least for 10, 20 years. Um, the strongest parts of the job market are those parts where the, the, those parts of the economy, they're still growing. And they, tend, they have tended to be services, the healthcare sector, I mean, people are still yeah. getting older. They still want, they're having their hips replaced. They're still getting don't, don't, injured. Don't go pick I didn't me. say your name. I didn't. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and, and those have been long growing sectors. And we, we will probably get into some of the dynamics are changing so that even in manufacturing, which had been of long term decline for many decades, you've seen some rebound. Um, but I think that. We should separate in our mind, and maybe it's the transition that you were going to make anyway. The problems facing the future, the jobs of the future, the jobs for our kids, and whether we will remain the richest country on earth are pretty different from the questions of, well, why has the unemployment rate not come down faster in the last 18 months? And it's important to separate those in our mind because we've got to have growth strategy yeah. an innovation strategy about that longer run stuff. So, but before we, so I want to very quickly turn to what some of the solutions are and what the jobs will look like for our, for our kids. Um, but before we get there, let's talk just for a second about the structural issues that have led us to this point where there's consensus among this group that we're in a pretty crummy job market where low quality jobs are being created. The, um, is it, just listening to you now, it seems like you're, a uh, simple answer would be the problem is that the economy isn't growing, and that's why we're, we're, yes. we're struggling so to recover. The, but are there the, other the, the, A issues? simple answer 
that's not that simple yeah. uh, to, to answer. Yeah, yes, that, that is, I think, the, the main um, source of the job market problem. I think the issues of structural unemployment, and, and just as one factual matter, but it is true that lower wage jobs have been growing faster, but overall, incomes, if, if the only jobs being created were low paying jobs and all the jobs being lost were high paying jobs, average incomes would be falling dramatically. They have not been. Yeah. We want incomes to go up. They have been basically stagnant. But the fact that they have been largely flat tells you it's not all horrible news. It's just not growing as fast as we need it to grow to be, to be making better news. We're in this kind of treading water mm -hmm. state. I think the issue of structural unemployment that people who are in one sector and now that sector is going to have problems, how they're going to shift to another one, or geographic mismatch, that the, you know, the jobs are in North Dakota, but the people are in, in what, Michigan and their house is underwater so they can't sell it. Those are important, but I don't, think, I don't think you should kid yourself. The fact is the overwhelming explanation for why the unemployment rate got as high as it went and remains as high as it is now is... We had a terrible recession. It's a demand story. They have, the, the growth has not been sufficient to warrant hiring of people to, to match the sales. Mm -hmm. the, the most important factor has not been skills mismatch. Okay. Does anybody want to add, before we move on, uh, the structural issues behind the... Uh, anyone want to challenge Austin or add anything to I, I'd love to challenge Austin, but unfortunately, he, he's right about a couple of things. I think... I go, stop the tape. <laughs> stop the tape. <laughs> it's an historic moment. I acknowledge this. Um, no, I mean, there is a lot of discussion about these spatial mismatches and, and how much yeah. the housing markets hurt the recovery because workers can't move to jobs. Uh, there's been a lot of discussion um, about just the skills gap. And... and, and those phenomena are real. I mean, you can find examples. That they, they don't have to be dismissed. But they've been around for a long time. We've had spatial mismatch discussions as long as I've been a professional economist. Um, and, and I'm now on my second hip. I mean, it's been a long time. Um, <laughs> it's, it's the top-line growth numbers that matter. That, yeah. that, that you can forgive a lot of sins if you're growing rapidly. Yeah. And, and that's what we're not doing. OK. Do you want to add one other structural thing? If it's true that small business is the number one source of new job growth, then I don't think that we have supported small business in the way that we really need to. At least in our industry, the primary voice in our industry is the National Restaurant Association, which represents and speaks for the interests of large Fortune 500 restaurant corporations. Small businesses have felt so left out of this conversation in our industry that we actually helped them form an alternative National Restaurant Association called RAISE, Restaurants Advancing Industry Standards and Employment. These small businesses have come together and said, actually, government is not listening to us or supporting us. The Restaurant Association definitely doesn't speak for us. We actually see uh, the ability to grow, produce more jobs, when we have what we call high road employment, better wages, better working conditions, we see less turnover, we see higher productivity, we see higher profitability, we're able to grow at a faster rate, in fact, when we create high road employment conditions for our workers. And we've got any number of examples around the country of the great small businesses that are doing this, but they continue to say that there are really structural problems with regard to support for their kind of growth, for creating a level playing field between them and large corporations Corporations like Olive Garden, Red Lobster, Applebee's. Mm -hmm. um, there are real structural problems that these small businesses face. On the spatial mismatch question, they also say, yes, it's really hard to find skilled you know, workers who know good customer service, in, even in the restaurant industry, which people may assume is a low-skilled job. It takes a lot of skill, actually, to work in a restaurant. And employers are increasingly looking for training programs and other programs that will help people do better. And that would serve not just restaurants, I mean, the owners and the workers, but frankly, every one of us that eats out. We would have better food and better service. So I think uh, investing in training programs like ours that actually create these matches between good employers and workers seeking jobs um, would serve everybody. Secretary Tell. You know, I came to this forum with the intent of uh, learning and not uh, to be confrontational. But I have to say that I disagree with everything she has said. Um, <laughs> number one, I'm not a defender of the National Restaurant Association, but I have worked with them during my tenure. 
and they are not comprised only of large corporate entities. They comprise of thousands, and you can go on their website, thousands of mom and pop stores. And imagine if you were an employer of a small enterprise. You have five, six employees. You're faced with the specter of the Affordable Health Care Act. You don't know what to do about that. You're faced with the specter of increased taxes. You can't get a loan because Dodd-Frank has frozen much of the liquidity in your community banks. You're concerned and scared about the future. So what are you gonna do? Are you gonna go out and take your reservoir of savings and hire someone? No, you're not. You're gonna take it with you, not do anything with it, and see what's gonna happen. So this, all this avalanche of government regulations and specter of uncertainty is creating an atmosphere that rational employers, small business mom and pop stores, are reluctant to commit their own capital. I'm of course concerned about those who are working um, at a lower wage, but Austin mentioned uh, and I have seen this also, it comes in across, um, healthcare is one of the most fastest growing um, sectors because the baby boomer generation is retiring and we don't have enough nurses, phlebotomists, um, you know, healthcare, home aides, doctors. We have a, a net deficit of more than a million nurses in the next 10 years. We have a deficit of doctors. So, all these, so Austin is right, and the healthcare is a growing sector, but the skill sets are different. But going back to, again, um, the example, 40% of people who earn minimum wage migrate out of minimum wage within one year. 80% of workers who work a minimum wage migrate out of minimum wage within two years. I don't want to get into an uh, argument about minimum wage because it's much, much too complicated. But it, when minimum wage has an impact on employment, and what we want is that we are increasingly a knowledge-based economy. We want workers to get into the workforce as quickly as they can, because for a worker that doesn't enter the workforce, they lose their grasp on the employment ladder. So we want people to come in, learn, grow, go up that skills ladder, as they get from one job to another to another, gain more skills, make themselves more valuable, they learn, they get you know, uh, training, and then that's how they get better jobs. We see in Europe all these young people at the age of 24 who are rioting in the streets because the employment rate is moribund in Europe, they cannot find a job when they graduate, and they fear that if they don't get a job, by the time they graduate, they will never have a job for the rest of their life. And Doug alluded to this. If you are a young person starting out in a recession, you will be forever disadvantaged in your overall life savings, I mean life earnings, if you started out in a recession. So economic growth is really important. Job creation is really important. Do you want to jump in, Austin? I don't know. There's two things. There's some things that I agree with that, but on the notion that the primary thing that's holding back job creation in the country is coming from uh, these regulations of the last two years. There's absolutely no evidence that that's true. So if you take the, it, the reason that small business lending dropped um, is not from Dodd-Frank. It started with the biggest financial crisis of all times and it has, it has not recovered. Small community banks got squeezed and crushed uh, the, many of the big small business lenders went out of business. If you look at, for example, the surveys of the NFIB and they ask small businesses, what are the biggest hurdles to your growth? One of the things they ask about is regulation. And it is up uh, uh, under President Obama, but it's nowhere, it's not the highest it's ever been. The highest it's ever been was actually in 1994 under Bill Clinton when Regulations, they were putting in lots of regulations, but it was the start of a massive employment boom, the likes of which we have not seen in a long time. Mm -hmm. And I think there is one thing you gotta, it, it, it's almost a religious decision you have to make, but there's two views of what leads to long-term economic growth. 
One view says we ought to have as little regulation or rules of the road or what have you as possible, as low a tax rate as possible, as little involvement of government as possible. The other side says not that we want big, onerous government. It says, do we need to invest in major public goods like the education and training system of the United States, like the economic infrastructure of the country, like research and development and science and engineering? And if you favor that, it takes money to do that. And so I think that if in your mind you believe that taxes and regulation are the main driver of growth, then ask yourself, why is Silicon Valley in California? Why do, California has always been a high tax state. It's always been a high regulation state. Why isn't it in Vanuatu or Kazakhstan or places where the tax on capital gains is zero? So you would think, wow, you can do anything you want to the groundwater on the, on the island of Vanuatu and you don't have to pay any taxes. Why don't great universities Move there. Why don't great companies head over there? Because they're all officially domiciled in Ireland. They're domiciled in Ireland. <laughs> and I think the answer is because to attract high-skilled people yeah. and to innovate requires a backbone of infrastructure and innovation that, that involves some aspect of, of, of public involvement, let's call so, it, of public investment. So, I don't want to spend too much time on this question of government, the government, how heavy or light government involvement should be. And I want to move to the... Um, can I can make just two factual observations to inform the debate? Very quick, please. I mean, I honestly, this is... Did he say two or true? Two factual observations. Two. One, um, there has been a noticeable drop-off in this recovery of startups. So there's this large, true. small business thing that people talk about, but new businesses create jobs. Yeah. And for whatever reason, we don't really know, it's, it's a missing piece of this recovery. And I think that's important and worth studying more. Mm -hmm. uh, the second is the income growth. That's a really important phenomenon because while all the attention gets paid on job creation and unemployment rates, you know, most people have jobs, but the income's not growing. And that's holding back their ability to spend, their ability to, to, to um, meet and their dreams. Of US GDP and it's why spending. they don't move. When things are growing rapidly, people have a lot of confidence that they can go get a job and, and earn an income, they have a little cushion. Bad, bad income growth is a big problem here. Yeah. Just very quickly, Saru. Please. Yes, um, so Elaine, my name is Saru, and uh, just, yes, I'm, I know uh, that. <laughs> We've been introduced re already. Refer to me as Saru rather than Oh, I'm she. so sorry. That's, That's okay. Um, so I actually know small businesses, and I've actually been a small business owner myself. I've opened and run two restaurants, one in New York, one in Detroit, and I actually work with hundreds of small restaurant owners around the country. So one is Jason from Russell Street Deli in Detroit, Michigan. Jason opened his business in 2007, actually at the end of 2007, right at the beginning of the economic crisis, and was committed, because he was a former restaurant worker himself, to providing livable wages to his workers. Now, Jason has provided a minimum wage of $10 plus tip to all of his employees in the front of the house, and at least $15 in the back of the house. He has experienced a 12% growth rate every single year since 2008. Uh, and he's doing really well. His community supports him. And Jason was recently with me in the halls of the US Senate saying, I believe in an increase to the minimum wage because I have seen how this helps my employees. I have seen how them doing better allows them to spend in the city of Detroit and spend in my restaurant, has allowed them to actually be more productive because they don't have to worry about paying the rent. And in terms of data, actually, on who earns the minimum wage and who lives in poverty, actually 60% of restaurant workers who live in poverty are adults. They are not children or young people moving on to something better. Most minimum wage workers are actually adults. Six, over 60% of minimum wage earners are adults. The median wage is in the late 30s. Um, and two, I mean, the restaurant industry, which is the largest employer of minimum wage workers in the United States, also has the highest rates of poverty among working adults. So these are people who are working full time and often more than full time, but experiencing literally three times the poverty rate of the US workforce, the rest of the US workforce, and 
in a, which is bad for all of us, using food stamps at double the rate of the rest of these workforce, not because they want to, but because they live in such extreme poverty that they have to. The people feeding us can't afford to eat themselves. Now, I don't know about you, but you know, in terms of happiness and having a job, I don't know too many people who can be very, very happy working more than full time and living in extreme poverty. So I want to move to our second, our second uh, take on this question. And there will be time in a little bit for questions from the audience. So you will have an opportunity to join this debate and ask your own questions. Um, so I want to go uh, to each of you and ask you, what are the most important things to be done uh, to stimulate job creation, high quality jobs? What are the key levers that we can uh, use? Secretary Chow, do you want to do you want to start with this question? If you if you had to actually, I wasn't quite prepared when you asked me the first time, so why don't okay. you ask Austin I'll, or no, okay. or Doug? Go ahead, Austin. Do you want to? Okay, look, I think the focus should be out of the the, the next six to twelve months is very contentious politically and there's a lot of argument of uh, is it having to do with the US or is the fact that it's happening in all the countries of the world an indicator that it has something more to do with the world economy. If you think five years, 10 years, 20 years, what do we need to do? I think it's obvious, it's totally obvious. At the individual city, state, and national level, those people, places, and countries with more skills and more education are doing way better. And they survived the downturn way better. The unemployment rate of college graduates is in the 3%. Mm -hmm. So uh, it, it, there's no question that that has to be the focus. And that it's not just that they do better at any one point in time. They've also proven remarkably better at adapting when new things come along. So if you look at places like Minneapolis compared to Detroit, they were both cold places, both in the Midwest. Minneapolis has done much better as an economy and in job creation than Detroit has. And the, large, the, the conclusion of much of the economics profession looked at it was in Minneapolis, they had a lot higher skill level of the workforce. And so as Milling and Pillsbury and a lot of the big employers phased down, medical devices, a bunch of other things phased up. And in Detroit, they had the lowest skill level of, mm -hmm. of workforce. So I think skill is number one, two, and three. And then maybe number four is, is the innovation economy and the, and the science and stuff. Doug, do you want to? So Austin has hit the first of what I think were the five. He's hit one, two, and three, actually. Yeah. <laughs> I don't give him a chance to count three times. Hey, so, his know. time's done. <laughs> <laughs> no, there are five structural reforms the United States needs to undertake to, to set itself up for the 21st century. And they're right in front of us. We know what they are. One is education, from K to 12 all the way through higher education to, to get better skills in the labor force, no doubt about it. Second, immigration reform. Simply no doubt about it. We need to get this right in the United States. I have a sermon on that. I'll spare you. Uh, third one. Uh, a fundamental regulatory reform. The United States ostensibly looks at new regulations and asks the question, are the benefits worth the cost? But it never looks back. It never asks the question, is this still worth doing? And we have uh, just uh, accumulated a lot of detritus in our regulatory over infrastructure. We just need to, to clean that out. Then we need to do a fundamental entitlement reform, some soup to nuts, so our social safety net doesn't collapse under, under financial weight. And we need a tax reform. We need a tax reform that means something, that raises the revenue necessary to fund the government. Those are five things that, that we're going to do because we have to, and it'd be better to do them now intelligently and proactively. Those are structural things where you look out five, ten years, we have to get done. What could you do now that would be really help? Well, you want to do things that are consistent with that and which could jumpstart the economy. And, and on that list, I think the, the most promising would be tax reform, where you could in fact, generate better growth incentives, raise the revenue we need, but unless you do the entitlement reform, the tax reform is never going to last because the spending is going to go through the roof and the tax system won't finance it. So, you know, there's a lot of work to be done, but, but we could do better easily than we're doing right now. We when just you say tried. tax reform, you mean cutting taxes? I mean having not revenues. We, we, we don't have enough revenue now, yeah. so let's be clear about that. I think you could easily get on the corporate side 
uh, a much lower rate. We're out of line competitively in a, in a broader base. On the individual side, I'd prefer uh, lower rates in a broader base, something like a Bowles Simpson approach. Um, I understand the politics of that at the moment. Mm -hmm. So the question is, which of those pieces could you get done? And, but we should do something. We're, we're not doing very well. Sarah, what are the most important things that can be done to stimulate job creation uh, right now? What is your short list? I mean, I totally agree with immigration reform. Yeah. We definitely need immigration reform. Mm -hmm. And like I've said, I think we do need to look at the growing aspects of our economy and support them. So they happen to be these very large service sector, con you know, industry sectors like restaurants and retail. I think we need to think about the fact that those are the growing sectors, support small business in those sectors, and also support high quality jobs in those sectors so that all of the growth isn't in the extremely lowest wage jobs. Mm -hmm. And that would include raising the minimum wage, yes, which we have seen in multiple states and localities to actually, you know, there are seven states in the United States that actually have the same minimum wage for tipped and non-tipped workers. They have the highest minimum wages in the restaurant industry of any states in the country compared to all other states. Five out of seven of those states have a faster growth rate among the restaurant industry than the rest of the country. So you actually see the cities and states that have higher wages doing very, very well in our industry. In fact, experiencing tremendous growth. So, you know, for me, having workers, millions of workers in these industries who have the ability to spend and stimulate their own sectors and the broader economy would definitely help our economy. Um, and of course, supporting these small businesses and even the growth of, for example, what we've done, the growth of worker-owned enterprises, cooperatives that actually are part of a new economy of uh, workers actually being able to create for themselves, create their own jobs, essentially. Secretary Chow. I think part of the big problem is, again, the lack of economic growth. And yes, there was a recession in 2008, but in previous cycles, when there's been a recession, the steeper the recession, the quicker the bounce back. So I think the question has to be asked, why is there not a quicker bounce back this cycle? And if indeed spending government money, as we saw in the stimulus, and increasing taxes and all these regulations does not, you know, actually helps economic growth, we should be having a boom economy. The average unemployment rate between, from the years 2000 to 2008 was 5.2 percent. We forget that. Uh, the unemployment rate went up to 10 percent, yes, it's dropped to 7.6, but it should be much lower, again, if we take into account all the discouraged workers who have left. So I don't, so it's really quite basic. I mean, those three factors in all the countries around the world have an impact, and they have a direct impact on job growth. I'm gonna talk a little bit about what jobs, of the, so we've gone through all of your, your ideas for how we create jobs. Um, and I wanna talk a little bit about what the jobs of the future look like and in where they are. I'm very self-interested. I have kids who are nine and 12 years old. And I'm very personally interested. I thought you were going to say, because you're in journalism. So you're, 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 you're. <laughs> That's my professional interest. My self-interest is what are the jobs that will be available to our children, and how are they different from the jobs today? There are a bunch of trends that we've spoken about yep. a little bit. There's things like automation. There's the increased use of technology. At the same time, you, you actually have growth in jobs that are, that are relatively low quality. Um, do you want to? Answer I would observe two question. things. That the, the one thing that cannot really be answered is the one thing that everybody wants to know. Well, what is the job 40 years from now? What job will be the best paying job? And I yeah. want to have that job. For and every and economist children. will say, but we, we don't know. A lot of those jobs, if you go back 40 years in the census, if you ask now of the top one third of paying occupation codes, what share of those occupation codes did not even exist in the census 40 years ago, it's a really high fraction. And so if you had said um, in 1910, how many people are gonna have a telephone in 2013, they would say, no, that's, that's totally impossible. Every man, woman, and child in America would have to be an operator pulling the cords out and sticking them in like this. Yeah. And yet we invent technologies that eliminated essentially every telephone operator in America but the unemployment rate in telecom did not go to 100% just because we came up with new technologies. We moved into these new things. So the good news is 
we have a 180 year track record of creating new jobs that 20 years later, everybody says, oh, we never thought of that, but now yeah. a lot of people do it. And two, the other good news is the government doesn't need to be relied on to figure it out. The business doesn't need to it's in everybody's own incentive to go out and figure out what jobs are promising careers, and they're out doing it every day. When they go to school, they're trying to figure out what major to pick. They're trying to figure out what summer internships to get. So I think overall the trends that you see of higher skill equals higher pay and, mm -hmm. and better performance in the job market is going to continue. You've seen a 60 plus year trend to, of more and more services based employment in the US and that will probably continue. Mm -hmm. But beyond that, I think it's, it's harder to say. Well, typical of the government, they actually do have a chart that tells all the jobs of the future. So, um, and I say this in support of what Austin is saying. Actually, the Bureau of Labor Statistics, if you're really interested, go on their website and they have um, surveys and studies on predictions on what the jobs for the future are. They don't range into the next 40 years, but there's a list. And basically what we're seeing is a gap between higher skill jobs um, that require higher skill labor. So for example, our country could have predominance in geospatial technology, in um, life sciences, uh, in biotech, but we're lacking the requisite skilled workers to fill those jobs. And so, as Austin mentioned, we're gonna see continuously more and more of these new jobs that are being created. And I think there's any uh, commonality it would be that they're increasingly more complicated, more sophisticated, and they require higher skills, more education. And studies have shown, and you go on the BLS, Bureau of Labor Statistics website, uh, the average er weekly earning of someone who's a high school dropout uh, is like you know, $456 uh, dollars a week. You contrast that weekly earnings, employment prospects, unemployment rates, overall earnings, there's no question that high, the higher educated individual will have um, better earnings, lower unemployment, uh, better job prospects. And there's also one last thing I would mention. We do talk about this income gap. There is an income gap. This income gap comes from highly skilled workers and those who are low, uh, relatively low skilled. Employers are willing to bid up the wages of those workers who have higher skills and that's why their wages are increasing. So what we are seeing in terms of the income gap is really a manifestation of the education and training gap. So we're gonna to go to audience questions in just one minute. Doug, you wanted to jump yeah, in? Yeah, I, I agree with Austin. We should have a, a very healthy- Stop the tape again. <laughs> get in there. Very, very healthy um, uh, modesty about our ability to forecast exactly what's gonna happen. We, we can't. But we know two long-term trends that inform yeah. this a little bit. One is, if you go from Paul Revere to now, and you look at the shares of the economy that are in agriculture, manufacturing, and services, the share in manufacturing has not changed dramatically. It's edged down a little bit, but it's sort of been there the whole time. And all we've done is we've moved people from farms to services. Yep. I wouldn't bet on a farming job. You would not. Bet. I would not. And given that manufacturing productivity goes up, the manufacturing jobs are actually not uh, a big bet for the future either. So services really is the key, and that's, that's what we've done as a nation. It's gonna continue. Second is, we will continue to get older. And if you wanna look at the, the shifts in the demands, it's gonna be the shifts that are driven by the demography that's inevitable. And we, we have, um, you know, we've been cursed by listening to boomers music my entire life. It's gonna continue. The products they like and demand are gonna drive uh, the jobs of the future. And healthcare has obviously been a big area. It's a big, a big part of it. So I think we'll go to, um, we'll go to the audience for questions. We, please raise your hand if you could uh, repeat your name, if you have any Organizational yeah, I didn't get a chance affiliation. to say what I thought about the jobs of the future. Okay, hold that thought quickly. We just I mean, have a few I minutes for questions. I think one thing that hasn't been brought up is that I do think we have to be concerned about our daughters in particular because uh, because the largest and fastest growing sectors right now are these low wage jobs because 70% of the workers on that ridiculously low minimum wage of $2.13 are women. 
because most young women, many young women actually go through this industry, work in this industry for some part of their career in high school, graduate school, college. Many of these workers are actually educated. 40% of these workers have college education and are working in the restaurant industry, so these are not completely uneducated people. Um, but they also experience very much higher levels of sexual harassment than, than other sectors. So the growing sectors of the economy, you know, 40% of all charges to the Equal Employment Opportunities Commission of sexual harassment come from the restaurant industry, even though 7% of American, uh, American women work in this industry. For any young woman being exposed to the world of work, this is how she's exposed to the world of work. She's exposed to an industry in which she can be paid $2.13 an hour, where she can be touched and talked to inappropriately, where any number of things can happen to her. In fact, I was speaking, I'm on a book tour, and I was speaking in San Francisco yesterday, and a young woman came up to me and said, what you said makes so much sense. I worked in the industry, in the restaurant industry, throughout high school, college, and graduate school, and law school. I went on to IBM, where I was sexually harassed, but in my mind I thought, gosh, this is nothing compared to what I experienced in the restaurant industry, so it must be okay. So I, I think it's important for us to think about these job quality issues as well. Okay. Thank you. Audience questions. Thank you. Is it on? Yes. Uh, you can hear me? Yeah, we okay, can hear good. you. Yeah, go ahead. I'm Linda Resnick. Um, Stuart and I are the largest farmers of tree crops in the world. We have 20 million trees in the San Joaquin Valley. And um, if you say farming isn't the future, you don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> so um, I just want to tell you as quickly as I can what we're doing. Um, I researched and found out that we have to put middle management um, in employees through 12 weeks of... Um, study before they can hit the factory floor. And um, these are people making thirty, forty thousand dollars $40,000 a year. We, um, and by the time you've invested 12 weeks in these people, you don't know if you like them and if they're going to work out. So we started something called Career Tech. And what we're doing is we're working with local community colleges, local high schools, creating a curriculum of career ag. Ag is not picking fruit anymore, not, not in our business. Every one of our 20 million trees has its own computer, so we don't put too many nitrates in the soil. We don't use up too much water and so forth. And so we're, we uh, identify these kids in seventh and eighth grade. They uh, are telling us if they want to be part of this. This is just starting in the ninth grade. By the time they finish um, high school, they will have two years of community college under their belt. They will have been shadowed. Uh, you know, they'll shadow executives in our companies, they'll have summer jobs there, and when they graduate, they can either go to work for us in a middle management job, or they can go on to a four-year school. But, and I'm hoping that the healthcare sector is inspired by this, and it, it is happening in small pieces around the country. You know, the community college system is actually the unsung hero of skill development in the United States, and people don't often think of it but it's actually absolutely where the rubber hits the road in many different industries. It's critically important, and it, it has the this, this money available to community college has, as you might imagine, you know, dwindled like, like everything else. It's a, it's a very tough environment. It is critically important when we do that, that we tie the private sector in with the public sector and doing it. So in Chicago, I met this guy, he runs a school. Mm -hmm. And this school is in the Pilsen neighborhood, which is heavily Hispanic neighborhood in Chicago, where the high school dropout rate is very high. So in this guy's school, um, he, he gets payments from the city to go get people who have dropped out, and he has kind of a career educational thing that that's a, uh, subsector of community college, let's say. And, and I asked him, how many people graduate, get a job? He said 100%. And I said, wow, whoa, wait a minute. That's, that's extremely unusual. The data on the, on the career technical academies is, not, you know, is mixed in the kind of the academic way, which is to say, it shows the opposite of what you want. So you say, well, it's mixed. We don't know what it shows. It, it, it hasn't been very good. And what you mean by that is completion rates for community college are, are pretty low. And, and, and at this, of technical academies at the high school level, yeah. people go through it, and then they can't get a job. And so I asked them, I said, the weakest link 
has always been, how do you figure out what to train them to do? And he said, what I do is I go to every business that's in a 10 mile radius of right here and I ask them, what do you need somebody to do? And in their case, it was, uh, there are a lot of warehouses and they need people to use the barcode. They need to somehow operate the barcode. And he said, in Chicago, they are having a hard time finding teachers for the, for the Chicago Career Academies to teach some kind of machine tool operation, numerically controlled machine tools or something. So they couldn't even find the teachers. So he went and looked, and he said, how many people have a job with that? And the thing, and the answer was zero. There's not a single person in Chicago who has that job. And so, of course, they can't find a teacher. But that was approved, and it, you can just hear the bureaucracy that it went through of like, no, no, they, that's the approved. So it's got to be public-private partnership or else it won't work. I mean, good for you for doing that. Let's take another question. Do we have a microphone on this side, maybe right here? Try, keep, keep going. Uh, if you okay. yell really loud, it'll sound like help, it's help. a microphone. Can you hear me? Yes, yes. we can yeah. hear you. Uh, Stan Kritzik, Milwaukee. If you look at the split between high school graduates, college graduates, community college graduates, and so forth, how well they're doing compared to the inner city dropouts of public school systems, it's enormous. Yep. And I'm not putting the blame on the teachers, the teacher unions, the politicians, the single family parents, the minorities, whatever. I'm saying this is a problem that needs to be addressed and it isn't going to be addressed by passing some quick piece of legislation and doing it with juniors and seniors in high school who already can't read their diplomas that they maybe are going to get. This is something that is going to take a long time, concerted effort at getting all of the pieces fixed, True. and it needs fixing. True. Because Though in fairness, their diplomas are in Latin. I, I think I would have a hard time <laughs> reading it. Yeah. You, look, you look at Washington, D.C., for example, their numbers are deplorable. My own city, Milwaukee, their numbers aren't much better. It's got to be fixed, but it's going to take a long time and a lot of concerted effort, public and private. Mm -hmm. Okay, let's go to this side for the next question. Do we... Uh, Actually, your microphone is heading to the middle there. Sorry. Hi, I'll stand up. Um, my name is Constance Neal. I'm a retired private school teacher from New York City, and I am a pre member of the pre-baby boom generation, which <laughs> may color some of my views. Has but better my, music. my question is, is technology a net job creator or destroyer? <clears throat> And when I read about things like driverless cars coming down the pike, and even restaurants where you don't need waiters or waitresses because you have computers and you just order automatically, and sometimes it seems to me like all these advances or supposed advance, advances are geared to eliminating people from doing anything that had meaning for them in the past. And I'd just like some people to comment upon that. This is a big fear. It comes up all the time. But if you look at, again, long periods of history, look, take again, from the revolution to now, when the United States went from an international nobody to the largest global economic power, our technologies transformed this country. And they're dramatically different. And over that period, we managed, on average, not every year, to employ Americans. The, the, so it's not that technology net creates or net destroys. It doesn't. On our, we'll, we'll get the, the jobs. It's going to change the character of those jobs. And um, uh, in the good news version of that, uh, the character will be people with skills take advantage of high technology. They earn a lot of money. And you see big examples of that. In the bad news story of that, people fail to keep their skills up to the, the necessary level uh, with modern technologies. And that's where we're starting to see trouble. So I don't think it's a technology issue. I think the, the story does come back to job skills. Yeah, I, I think um, I totally agree with you and see that as well in large sectors, not, not just restaurants, food retail, you know, all of the people who used to check us out, now we work with an, you know, a robot, basically. Um, and 
certainly technology is not something to hate or be stopped or to fear. I agree that, you know, certainly we need technology. Technology has created great advances for all of us. I do think there's a loss of human contact in, in our society, in our country. And unfortunately, the people who have lost out the most from technology replacing jobs are low wage workers who don't have supports right now out there to deal with massive levels of layoffs because of technology. So I think it would be okay for a net, okay, you know, net balance for technology to not create loss since the Industrial Revolution if there were supports for people who were losing their jobs because of technology to train them to move on to something better. If, and and I, this is a role for government intervention where government could provide funding for training, for supports, for you know, some kind of safety net for people who are losing their jobs. Do you want to? Uh, is there another, another question? Okay, or? we'll take another question. Uh, on this side here, maybe right down here in the front. Thank you for sitting in the front. Yeah, he's gonna give a reward to you guys. <laughs> <laughs> Good brave. afternoon, uh, Ron Christie from Washington, D.C. Um, earlier today, the Massachusetts legislature passed a bill that would require the governor to seek a waiver of the Affordable Care Act. The rationale for this waiver is that they believe that under the premium uh, rating system that it would cause premiums for small businesses in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts to increase by up to 60%. So my question to you, Austin, is earlier you said that it was a little speculative perhaps to think that the Affordable Care Act wouldn't have an impact from a regulatory stamp standpoint on jobs. How do you reconcile the fact that the Demo democratically controlled legislature in Massachusetts wants to require the Democratic governor to seek a waiver because they think it'll hurt small business? Okay, I'll say two things. First, um, I, I will go look at this. I wasn't aware of it. Massachusetts already has universal coverage of a model that the ACA was largely patterned on. So I, uh, there might be something a little weird about the interaction of Massachusetts with the system. But the overall, what I said, which I think is rather obviously correct, is the explanation for why the job market has been troubled from to the end of 2007 up to today is not attributable to the ACA, which has not even yet been put in place. If you think, the, the normal way economists go look at what's the impact of some regulation is to go compare a treatment group versus the non-treated group. So, we have a good idea that the Clean Air Act of 1977 had a negative impact on employment in manufacturing because they go look at factories in counties where it's binding and they compare them to factories in counties where it's not binding in the same industry and you see a big difference. In this case, the ACA does a, creates a few cliffs. One is if you have more or less than 50 employees. If you have fewer than 50 employees, there is no employer mandate. So it, that, that does not apply. And so you would expect to see some differential impact on if you're above or below the 50 threshold. Likewise, if you're an industry like aerospace where almost everybody's already covered, the mandate is irrelevant. If you're in an industry like restaurants where very few people are covered, the mandate is highly relevant. And therefore you would say, well, let's go compare industries where the coverage was higher before, do we see job growth has been higher in places where the coverage was higher before? The data shows nothing of the sort. No matter how you cut these things, you do not see a noticeable impact in the data of what should be there from the ACA. So that's why I say it's more than speculative. Thus far, the evidence is not that that is driving employment. Now, if we get into the en enactment and then you start to see a big threshold right at 50, you start to see a bunch of people shift employees to get them under the 30 hour cutoff. Those will be the kinds of things, or you start seeing industries where they had more coverage or less. Those would be the kinds of things that you would that, that you'd say would be having an impact. But thus far, it's, it's just not factually correct that you've seen anything like that. We have time for one more question and I'm gonna again reward the gentleman in the front here for being brave and getting here early, presumably. So, thank you. We have just time for a quick question. A quick, a quick question. Uh, Bob Mendelson from Chicago. Uh, I'm active uh, at a university, and one of the questions we've been uh, discussing is you're having some students going to be going to school, 
uh, going to university, maybe getting loans. You know the student loans are very high. They graduate with degrees that they can't go out and get uh, uh, jobs. The question is, does the university have a responsibility to direct you to getting a job with, uh, after with a degree you, with that, your that degree. you paid, right. in some cases, over $100,000 for? Secretary Chow, do you no. want to take this one? I, I couldn't no. hear the question. Okay. The question is, if people are going to universities, taking a lot of student debt, but in a lot of the majors they can't get jobs that will, that will pay for their debts, do the universities have some obligation to steer them in ways or inform them in to ways? To provide them. To, well, to that's actually quite them. interesting because the Affordable Health Care Act actually nationalized student loans so that, uh, and then with an increase the interest rate. That's a fact. So now we actually have nationalized the whole health, the whole student loan program in an effort to fund uh, the Health Care Act. So we've jacked up the interest rates on student loans, so students are paying more. And at the university level, there are two items in every state budget. One is health care, Medicare, Medicaid. One is education. So as health care increases in the state, the state has had to cut down on university support. So the students and the university community are hurting in two ways. They're getting cutbacks in their university funding, and then their student loan interest rates are going up. And that's a terrible dilemma to be in. So we're going we're gonna to have to end it. I thank you for this lively, one thing, thoughtful discussion. The art, look, I'm an economist, so you know I love numbers and this, but you guys are uncontrollable. Turning, turning the arts or something that can't be quantified into like the university is going to tell you, no, you can't be a philosophy major. You know that that doesn't pay. Your own father can tell you that. You know, you know like you. you, you hopefully, we're not we're not come to that. I'm well, one, thank I, thank I, you I, for I'm one it. important thing. I mean, I'm you know, we have, to, we have to stop here. We're really okay. sorry. We're over time. Thank you.